Good morning. Today is Friday, November 29th, 2024, and happy Black Friday. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope everybody is having a great little holiday. Today, I wanted to cover this little viral thing that's going on kind of in the engineer productivity, maybe engineer management space around people who don't do any work or what they're calling, quote unquote, ghost engineers. So according to a Stanford study, 9.5% of software engineers are ghosts. With a performance below 0.1x the median engineer, they do virtually no work, they might work multiple jobs, etc., etc. And initially, I did not want to cover this. I did not want to talk about this because it just seemed like the most baseless kind of viral thing somebody would just tweet out or you know put on CS career questions trying to go viral. Uh, but then 404 Media picked it up and they did an interview with the guy and the tweet started to gain more and more momentum. It went over you know Business Insider and Forbes and et cetera, et cetera. It's currently sitting at about 4 million views. So I think it's worth giving my hot take, having been in engineering for eight plus years now, um, I think it's worth breaking this down and talking about it. I also saw this really excellent video from Alberta Tech, which I definitely recommend. She goes into depth about sort of how the study was conducted, supposedly. It's not yet been published, it's not been peer reviewed, so who knows? But uh, she goes into depth with what they're talking about, with how engineer productivity typically gets measured and many of the pitfalls you run into when attempting to measure engineering productivity. In this video, I want to talk about more the philosophical side of this and talk about some of my own stories, having maybe been a 0.1x engineer at some points and what that actually meant for the business that I was working in. The first thing worth mentioning is that this is more or less not a new idea. There's been software and surveillance suites out there that have attempted to measure engineering productivity to find deficits in order to correct for that and then extract more value out of engineers within your engineering org. This is not a new idea. This has been going on since the 90s, since the dot-com bubble. This is really, in essence, a replay of these ideas, but with the interesting AI spin on it. See, what they did for this supposed study, again, it hasn't been published, but they used AI to evaluate code written by software engineers to then give it some evaluation to look at if it's expensive, it's affordable, if it's scalable, if it's work that really matters, and then attempting to continue to automate away some of that code review element. This, I think, is the key to understanding this whole thing. Uh, it's very, very hard for AI to quantify lines of code that are changed or changes within the semantics of code that correlate to knowledge work or even organizational work within a bigger engineering org that happens to result in that code output. And everybody's heard this story before. Maybe you make a five line change in a piece of code um, and that five line change is small. It's a relatively small code review to actually make, but it could have been weeks of research. It could have been months even of gaining alignment around an engineering or around product, uh, even with leadership and executives to make that actual change and ship it into the code base, into production eventually. Again, I will state this, it is very, very hard for AI to quantify that part of it. It can look at the five lines of code that you changed, but it's gonna have a very hard time quantifying and then assigning some sort of monetary value to this based on that knowledge work and that organizational work that maybe you did to make that output. And they even fall into this fallacy a little bit deeper, attempting to measure the distribution of commits per month among engineers, basically flatly stating that those engineers are just making dramatically fewer commits over time compared to their peers within the engineering org i.e. they're just not pushing as many commits, they're maybe not making as many pull requests, whatever flavor of that, they're just not pushing as much code. Again, this just falls into that classic fallacy. Maybe that five lines of code that you committed was weeks and weeks of work, understanding and discovering and then researching, working within the engineering org to make that change. It's basically impossible to attribute commits to actual value, given that there's just such a broad range of what a commit's value could actually be. Bots make commits all the time on pull requests. Just go look at GitHub Actions anywhere within any open source project. There's just bot commits all over the place. And those are good, that's some automation 
but that's like extremely low value stuff that's just been automated away. The very high value stuff that may take weeks and weeks to actually land a commit, that range is just so broad. They continue to go on and say that some $90 billion by their estimates has been wasted globally by these ghost engineers, by these 0.1x engineers. Now, you might assume that my stance on this is that these 0.1x engineers don't exist, their study is misplaced, is you know just wrong in some cases, but I don't actually think that's the case. I do think that there are some people who don't do any work. We've all worked with these people in the past. Um, at least I've worked with these people in the past, um, especially during the pandemic. It was bad. There were people who were doing the whole overemployed thing, working two or three jobs, trying to essentially steal from these employers um, by you know working as many jobs as they possibly could and doing as little work across those jobs as they could manage. Let's ignore that though. That's just obviously bad and illegal probably in most cases. Um, don't do that. But how I wanna frame this and look at this is actually through the lens of one of my favorite books from the last year, Cal Newport's Slow Productivity. This book lays out a fantastic framework for doing excellent work, probably the best work that you could possibly do in your entire career, through a slow burn, through the slow productivity, through the deep work mindset, which gets rid of all the garbage of productivity and surveillance software and ignores most of what modern business and modern engineering orgs today would say is quote unquote productive. In the beginning of the book, he sort of lays out a lot of the problems with overwork and over productivity and this sort of overwhelming sense of always having to be busy. In it, he writes, people were overwhelmed, but the sources of this increasing exhaustion weren't obvious. Online discussion of these issues offered no shortage of varied and sometimes contradictory theories. Employers were relentlessly increasing the demands of their employees in an attempt to extract more value from their labor. No, it's actually an internalized culture valorizing busyness driven by online productivity influencers that's leading to our exhaustion. Or maybe what we're really seeing is the inevitable collapse of late stage capitalism. Fingers were pointing and frustrations vented, all the while knowledge workers continue to descend into increasing unhappiness. The situation seemed dark, but as I continued my own research on this topic, a glimmer of optimism emerged. So he's really saying that like, especially knowledge workers with the meetings and the stand-ups and the constant need to show up and be quote unquote productive, whatever that means in your organization, sending emails, the amount of times that you're moving your mouse in an hour, the little green square on Slack or Teams showing that you're online, those things, especially for knowledge workers, just end up being such a burden and can really lead to this just over exhaustion and unhappiness in the workplace. He inevitably lays out the ideas for what he calls slow productivity, a philosophy for organizing knowledge work efforts in a sustainable, and meaningful manner based on the following three principles. Do fewer things, work at a natural pace, obsess over quality. And he lays out in the rest of the book, definitely go buy it, go read it, follow his YouTube channel, excellent stuff. He lays out in the rest of the book how knowledge workers can achieve some of the best work that they've ever done by actually doing less, by actually ignoring some of the things that are dramatically unimportant. So with this study, what I actually suspect is happening is maybe there's a flip side of it. And the one chart that really makes me think that is this one, where the percentage of ghost engineers by work arrangement, where there's 6% of productivity people in the office, 9% are hybrid, and 14% are remote. They would assert that those 14% of ghost engineers who work remote, oh, that's that's bad. Those people aren't actually doing real work. But I would theorize that the people in the office are the ones who are the most worried about being productive. You know, they gotta jiggle the mouse as much as possible. They gotta show up to the meetings. They gotta show up on time. They gotta be in the office so they, you know, are quote unquote showing up, at least by some of these metrics with commits and uh, some of this AI assertion of what's actual quality in these pull request reviews. But those remote workers, they maybe actually have the space 
to ignore some of the unimportant work, uh, establish slow productivity and deep work where they can actually do some really, really meaningful stuff. And I actually wanna frame this from one of my own stories. When I worked at Amazon as a remote employee, I was working on a team and I was asked to help another team, uh, another two pizza team, integrate their software with our software. So I can't give the full details because a bunch of this is like internal and blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. But essentially it was a reporting technology within AWS and it needed to deeply integrate with Bottle Rocket, the open source operating system I was working on to enable sort of better quote unquote reporting across the entire AWS ecosystem and entire landscape. This ended up being weeks of research weeks of writing docs and going back and forth with leadership, understanding the requirements, understanding what needed to be shipped and how it needed to land inside of the operating system, inside of the open source ecosystem, weeks understanding the underlying technologies with C groups and Linux and how the containerization bits of Bottle Rocket work, weeks understanding how their team worked and how their piece of software worked. I had never seen this thing before. I just showed up and was expected to help them uh, basically build a big new feature inside of their suite of software. This was weeks where I was not pushing commits, where I would have showed up as a ghost engineer in this study, where I was deep doing the knowledge work, doing the slow productivity to try to derive a lot of value from this ultimate product feature. In the end, we all came to a consensus I shipped the necessary bits to the project on the other team into Bottle Rocket on our side, and inevitably it reached some production state. And that meant potentially, in theory, millions and millions of dollars saved in unnecessary reporting cases that would have been bubbled up otherwise, and millions and millions of dollars saved in wasted time by engineers within AWS trying to resolve uh, these little nits and bits that would have otherwise just been automatically fixed by our feature. So my question then is in that case, being a ghost engineer for six plus weeks, when really I was doing the hard organizational and engineering and knowledge work to understand how this should have happened, I became the ghost engineer to go do that. If these people had it their way, I probably would have been pipped, probably would have been laid off because, oh, obviously wasn't making commits. Um, there's no code for him to, you know, he's not doing any work. We should, you know, immediately lay off, which unfortunately is exactly what they recommend. This ultimately is a case that they are trying to make for layoffs and trying to get people to uh, understand, you know, from the business side, from the executive side, the problems with these ghost engineers and the money that they could be saving by actually laying them off, finding them and getting them out the door. So I guess ultimately with anything, um, it is complicated. Um, it is very complicated, especially in a very complicated field like computer science and engineering. There's so much nuance to this. I do not think it's as black and white as they lay it out. Yes, there are people at companies who do nothing. Yes, overworking is definitely a thing. I've worked with those people in the past. It's not fun. But there are so many people who have adopted this mindset that you have to be productive and busy and showing that you're working all the dang time. When really, ironically, I would say that those people who the 14% working at home, maybe they're the actual productive ones who are adopting a bit more of the slow productivity and have a bit more space to actually do the hard knowledge work that will land the big features and the big innovations that will actually make the difference for the business in the end. Not much more to say about this one. Again, go watch Alberta Tech's video on this. Read the interview at 404 Media, links down in the description for this. And I will catch you guys in the next one. Thanks so much, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you then.